We're going to start our conversation on today's topic, facilitating a fast response by international organizations in crises and conflicts. As I've mentioned before, we have with us Donata Garassi. She's the Director for Political Affairs in the Office of the UN Special Envoy for the Great Lakes. She has more than 20 years of experience working with leading multilateral and bilateral agencies in the field of peace and security, such as the OECD, the World Bank, and the UN. She has worked in many countries around the world, including Rwanda, Afghanistan, Nepal, Sri, Sri Lanka, Indonesia, and in the Middle East. Welcome again, Donata. Also with us is Sarah Bressan. It, She's a research associate at the Global Public Policy Institute in Berlin, where she contributes to the Institute's work on peace and security. Specifically, she focuses on strategic foresight and quantitative forecasting for policy planning in relation to Europe's external action. Welcome to both of you. In our first session, many of you remember, we talked about the change within the UN system towards a stronger focus on conflict prevention. Last week, we looked at the potential of big data and artificial intelligence for this field of work. Today, we want to talk about how all the information and analysis made can support faster responses by international organizations, policymakers, and other stakeholders. Sarah, let me start with you. In your research, you focus on Europe. Which approach is the EU taking on prevention of violent conflicts or other crises? Thank you. Hello. Happy to be here. So um, the reason I'm looking at Europe at the moment is because the EU actually has an, an early warning system that is in place for a few years already. Um, so there is a full system where you have a variety of different analyses that come together and that actually trigger some response, right? Already, as you said, conflict prevention is trending. If you want to prevent something, you need to have an idea of what will happen. Um, and everybody wants to do some sort of anticipatory analysis. Um, and the EU has been doing this for a few years. Um, and what they are doing uh, is called uh, an early warning system, but I would say it's actually more of a risk assessment tool. And the EU itself uh, rather calls it a tool for evidence-based risk assessment and action. Um, May and I jump in there quickly for maybe for the non-experts in these different systems? What's the difference between an early warning system and a risk assessment tool, as you yeah, just mentioned. Yeah, I'll come to that. So, because actually, I think it's a quite interesting, uh, interesting difference to think about, even if it sounds a little bit academic, maybe or like very conceptual. But the question is, what do you want to prevent? Right? What is the action that should follow? Um, and early warning, as the name says, um, indicates that you have a warning that you act based upon that, right? And so we have, for example, in the humanitarian world, warning about uh, typhoons, natural disasters, or flooding, where it's really clear that there are warning signs um, and there's a certain likelihood of something happening afterwards. Um, and there is maybe like a shorter time frame of only a couple of days uh, where you, in this time frame, then can evacuate people, you can trigger certain financing mechanisms, and act early. And this is really warning and reaction. Whereas when it comes to conflict, um, and we can see this in the EU example, is that um, the EU and their analysts, they look at risk factors of conflict and other maybe political crises. And it's very difficult to say, like, when will a conflict break out? Or when will there be more fighting, right? And so um, what happens, and I think um, the EU tool really reflects these challenges, is that they look at where there is risks, and then they look at a long-term approach of what we, how can we retool our whole portfolio of economic, peace building, development, trade, um, and really all the tools we have in order to really support um, an approach that helps prevent conflict in the long term. Um, and as I said, in the EU, this is in place, um, and it's one example of how it's actually possible to combine data analysis, intelligence, um, experts on the ground, field visits, 
um, but also a political priority of where can the EU really make a difference and then select countries um, and basically uh, revamp the approach that the EU takes in, in different fields. Um, how long, let's, maybe you have an example between the time that a risk is assessed, analyzed, and maybe appropriate measures are being taken and action. What's the app? Is there an average time that it takes to actually make a change in all these policy measures that you mentioned? I mean, as I said, it really depends on what you would really like to prevent, right? Um, also in the area of conflict, it may be worth monitoring certain protest movements um, where there's uh, only a small time difference between like escalating protests, maybe riots and then potential violence. Um, if you know that an election is taking place at a, in a country where there has been a history of electoral violence, you already know this years in advance that this election will, will take place and there are structural risks. And I would say this is also one of the key challenges that if you look at the partly academic analysis or also the analysts in the organizations, um, the work that is happening there is not always really tailored towards what are the tools that we have and what can we provide in terms of assessment or warning so that it's really enough time for us to react um, and in a way that it matches basically the capabilities of the organization that you're providing the analysis with. What are some of the developments and changes you observe in this area of work to maybe be able to react faster? Yeah, so I think um, Forecast-based financing is really one area in the humanitarian field uh, where organizations uh, think a lot about how to make their financing instruments more flexible so that funds can actually reach areas um, where disasters are happening. Again, this is more in the area of natural disasters, but um, organizations are also very interested to look into um, conflict um, and basically human-induced uh, disasters. An area where this comes up a lot is um, climate change, where, where there is a conflict risk related to um, the consequences of, of uh, environmental degradation. And so these fields come together. And one of the developments is really that um, some actors start seeing that their things can be learned from the other side. Um, but there's also a need to really compare what's different, right? As I said, if there's a natural disaster, you, what you really want to do is mitigate the impact. Well, if you predict a certain conflict risk or maybe even onset of a conflict with a certain probability, you want to avoid the entire conflict from happening, right? So, so there are differences there. Um, and the same goes for integrating different types of analysis with longer time frames where basically scenario planning is more long term um, and then it goes down to structural analysis and really early warning, integrating those. Um, and what's also, I mean, it's an exciting field because a lot of actors are active there and, and in a way, no matter what, who we talk to, they encounter similar challenges, like what warning signs to monitor, uh, how to see when something changes and when there's really an urgency to react and also how, co how to communicate this. Uh, thank you. Let me um, go to Donata for a question. Donata, you have extensive experience in the field. Have you seen changes in the response time to conflicts? And if so, what has enabled them? Has the research and the tools that are being used made changes? Is it more on a political level? What is your experience? Thank you. Um, I can't say that I have seen changes really in the uh, response time, but I have seen changes in the type of responses that have been provided. Um, I think throughout the last few years, we have developed a much better understanding of uh, conflict, conflict patterns, drivers of conflict. We have developed better tools, um, indicator risk assessment tools that have enabled us to better understanding um, the dynamics of a conflict and the triggers and better anticipating perhaps uh, when and as a conflict might become violent. And that has um, likely contributed to a better capacity to provide responses. But I want to qualify what I'm saying with two elements. One is um, 
one thing is the understanding. So I think we've become much better at understanding the whole conflict setup. Um, and we, like I said, and, and I think Sarah said as well, there are tools up there that we can use and that we have been using, be it the UN or others. But where I think that the problems has persisted has been in the uh, capacity to then respond to the conflict situation. And, and that has a lot to do with the politics of the conflict as opposed to, or I understand very well why parties are fighting, why there are uh, violent uh, riots and et cetera. And where I think we, we we're still struggling nowadays is exactly in um, defining and designing these responses that are based more on a immediate political economy analysis of the interest and incentives of the parties that are part of the conflict rather than very structured scenario planning exercises and risk assessment matrices and all of that. So conflict is inherently political. We know that, so that's nothing new. Um, and it's becoming more and more so, and it's becoming more complex in terms of regional dynamics. And so I think that uh, we need to spend more time sitting down and thinking, okay, so what in this particular context is driving a decision making of those who can make a difference on whether we continue with conflict or not. And on this one, we haven't made enough improvement. So you have kind of all the instruments, or most of the instruments are there. Uh, you have access to them, thanks to the technology, you have immediate access to them. But the, the political side of the machine still requires um, a different level and a different type of uh, uh, mobilization in terms of responses. And that's where I think uh, things are not uh, working that well. Last comment uh, that I want to make and as, a, as a way of an introduction. Um, I think the increasing complexity of the conflict, co conflict setup that we're dealing with means that we're dealing with many more geopolitical actors and dynamics which therefore uh, makes it more complicated than if you're dealing with a civil war of the 80s or 90s where you had uh, a few parties on one side and a state on the other and you were trying to deal with that kind of situation. So improvement, yes, um, but not necessarily in terms of the results that we managed to achieve on the ground. Um, let me stop there for the next question. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so I hear that there's an improvement in tools and in knowledge, but the politics around conflicts has also gotten more complex and sometimes the new tools cannot keep up with the speed of the changing nature of the conflicts. Um, I also heard that, you know, on the political side, and I want to go back to something that Adriana said um, or wrote in her paper, she was one of the first speakers um, in the first session, in her paper um, on, you know, making conflict prevention a concrete reality at the UN, she said that many policymakers lack the data literacy skills to interpret early warning system, um, partly because they often have very little time that they can devote to nuance analysis. Um, is that an experience uh, you share in your work, uh, Donata? Have you seen that, that there's a lot of analysis out there, but policymakers maybe lack the time um, to actually go into all the detail that the researchers can, and then they don't use all the data because it's too much? Is Donata still with us, or did she just drop out? Looks like she's frozen, so maybe we can jump to Sarah. Yes, back. Sarah, from your research side, how is the commun uh, communication between people in research, experts in risk assessment, and policymakers working out from your experience? Yeah, I think uh, Adriana definitely has a point when it comes to risk literacy, right? Because as I said, it's hard to, like you cannot predict with uncertainty what will happen. And there's always like a probability uh, in a number and even an error term or some sort of like, you know, uh, 
more elaborate uh, result and then the more complicated uh, it gets like if you talk about things like artificial intelligence dynamic analyses um, the more uh, complicated these analyses get the harder it is to eventually be the one who takes the decision and really interpret what this means um, but i would add that also i mean or even because of that um, there needs to be a readiness to act under uncertainty because this uncertainty is not going to go away and what we're also looking at is, um, I mean, it's not like policymakers are not confronted with a lot of complex information, right? It's just uh, very different. It's like very different people who come to them who present them with information and they constantly assess information and judgments. It's just how is this done and how is it different when they're confronted with numbers? Um, and, and in addition to that, and I mean, obviously, uh, we can we can criticize the political side, um, but I think also, as I said in the beginning, on the part of the analysts, um, there could be more done in terms of really looking at what are the challenges, what are the tools that are there, and how can we bring what is useful, right? How can we explain it in a way that is more useful? Um, because there's also research that not only shows a lack of political willing willingness as a problem. Uh, but also this challenge to make a warning or a risk assessment more user-centered. Like what will the person in front of me understand? What will they, they think? How can I be like very credible? How can I, you know, not just uh, basically keep sounding alarms about everything that's happening in the world and then it's very different for them to decide which one is actually worth acting on. Um, so from both sides, like there's definitely room for improvement. Thank you. Uh, Donata, is your connection back again? She's still with us, but apparently she is still frozen. Okay, so we'll keep on discussing with Sarah. This is the new risk in the online world. Um, Sarah, there's a question here. What are three indicators that you've found most useful in predicting political conflict? What needs to be included in some of the tools or methods? Yeah, so, so in these um, structural models that the EU, for example, is also using, it is um, indicators that have been related to conflict risks. So, for example, um, um, economic inequality uh, and, you know, things that the literature finds um, in countries where conflicts very likely like discrimination of minorities, um, especially also for risk of mass atrocities. Um, sometimes it's even uh, factors that involve, um, for example, the satisfaction of the population, obviously, with the institutions, with the governments. And this is also an area where um, there's a lot of room of, for improvement in terms of data availability. Like perception data is one area that is very useful because, you know, um, political action is very much not, not only dependent on objective uh, measures, but really um, perception of the population that you can get with survey data, um, but which is difficult and also having this, this data over a long time and also having it reliably um, with, a, with a global coverage, these are things that, that are challenging in this area. Um, and uh, what's also interesting to note is that um, the reason why it's difficult to really prescribe action is that the factors that are good at forecasting conflict are not the same as those that explain conflict in, in models explaining conflict. And so it's hard to like take a forecasting model and then say, okay, we have like a factor, like let's say inequality that predicts our conflict in, in, in a forecasting model. Um, but the, the evidence on like how exactly it's related, what's uh, the mechanism really leading to it is more difficult. And that's also why different methods are being combined. Thank you. Um, Donata, I see you. Uh, do you hear me? Yes. yes, I'm sorry about that. Internet in Arabi has been really awful lately. That's okay. I just said that's the risk of the new online world. Um, there was a question from the audience. Um, what are three key indicators that you have found most useful in predicting political conflict? Um, Human rights violations. Um, I know that's um, something that uh, has been on the agenda of uh, the UN for many years before I joined the UN. 
Um, I am convinced, and I've seen it, uh, including when I was outside, that when you see an increase in human rights violations, so limitation to civil liberties, to freedom of expression, freedom of participation, incur illegal um, incarcerations, and all sort of uh, uh, increased violations, as we've seen in some countries in the region where I work recently, is a pretty good predictor of, uh, of conflict. Um, I, um, yeah, let, let me stop there. So that, that's a really good one. And then perhaps another um, good indicator is um, the uh, shocks, shocks, economic shocks, um, shocks, for instance, in food prices that we've uh, seen in some of the countries in North Africa in the, uh, a few years ago, um, that built on a situation that is already fragile from a governance point of view. But these are, are, are pretty good um, indicators of uh, potential violence to come. So these are just two different examples that I think have been fairly reliable in terms of predicting uh, violence that, I, um, that I'd like to share. Thank you. And maybe since you're back, let me um, put the question that I've already asked um, Sarah to you again. Um, Adriana, who was a speaker in our first session, in one of her papers says that many policymakers lack the data literacy skills to imp interpret early warning systems, um, most often because they have little time to devote to nuanced analysis. It sounds a little bit like too much information to digest to make political decisions in a short period of time. Um, have you seen that? Do you share that assessment? Um, can you share some of your experiences in that field? Yeah, sure. Um, I think a lot to do, um, so there's a lot of information out there, and yeah, I think it's, uh, it's our job. I, I work in a political office, I'm a political uh, advisor. It's our job to, do, to distill the information. So if you find yourself that you're with too much information and that's what you need to use to take your decisions, then you're going you're gonna to be in trouble. You need to identify, spend much more time identifying what is your problem, what is the problem that you're trying to solve, and then look for the specific information that is going to help you solve that problem, for instance. One of the main challenges that I have had in the last few years has been, and I was referring briefly to it before, understanding the interest and incentives um, that influence the decision makers or the influencers or the change makers in my region nowadays. So I need to understand what these interests and incentives are. There's a lot more information out there that tells me hundreds of thousands of things about the conflicts in the Great Lake and the historics and everything and everything. Well, that information right now is not necessarily going to help me. I need to have it in the background, but it's not going to help me taking a decision on tomorrow I'm going to try to negotiate with leader X and this is what I'm going to try to to do and how I'm going to try to do it. So I think it's 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 the job of people like me, people who are in the, in, in decision-making position when it comes to the politics, to distill the wealth of information and first and go deep into those few information that are really going to make a difference in their capacity to take action. And in my field of world, take action means influencing others in doing one thing rather than the other. When it comes to the, um, those who provide all this wealth of information, well, it's the more is out there, the better, I suppose. Um, but there is also a kind of a need, in my opinion, to uh, have clearing houses. So um, clearing houses that um, clean up some of the information that is provided. I have a few people in my team who do that for me. So they're my clearing house. And, you know, throughout the day, I, I would say half of the information that comes to me um, is, is good and half of it is not good but luckily my clearing house tells me right away this is fake news, this is fake this, this is fake that. It's becoming more of a problem nowadays but the other reason is because things on the ground change very very quickly, right? So whereas in the past you could have taken a year to do your conflict analysis and political economy analysis nowadays it's, you have to react quickly. There's uh, the dynamics of the decision making must be uh, faster. 
you have to take it upon yourself to have that capacity. You cannot expect others, researchers and scientists to give you what you need at any point given in time. It's, it's really your responsibility as the professional who's out there in confronted with the reality. I don't know if that uh, gave you an idea of uh, the thinking there. Thank you. Thank you. Let me put one more question to both of you before um, we give the audience to reflect and then enter a Q&A. And I see some of the questions in the chat. I'll include them later in the Q&A session. Um, what do you think needs to change so that international organizations can react faster to stay ahead of the developments? Donata, you just mentioned that you, know, you don't have a year's time these days because developments on the ground are so fast. Um, and in order not to just react to something, but be proactive in this field, what are some of your suggestions or ideas coming from the field? Um, uh, if I don't mind, I'll take the floor just because I'm so scared of the internet. Being yes, yes, go ahead. <laughs> Since we have you, we won't take the risk of looking at <laughs> you again. <laughs> yeah, so um, I think there are two issues. Um, well, first of all, Big organizations like the United Nations, I think you can reform and try to reform and do whatever you want to make them faster. They're always going to be slow decision makers because the vetting process of all the decisions is so complicated and has so many layers that you are unlikely to get to any situation in the near future where an organization like the UN becomes fast at acting. That that's not because they're not good or the people are not good, but that's because it really has to go all the way up and then down again. And then there's the consultation and member states, what have you. But two, two things, in my opinion, could make a big difference. And they're not new. So the first one is risk-taking attitude. I think leaders who are in positions of decision-making in the field or in New York or whatever your organization is based need to be enabled to take risks. I think we're becoming more and more risk averse. Uh, there are, can you still hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, yes. great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I mean, more risk averse as opposed to uh, readier to take risks. So that's number one. And number two, the competence on the teams that you have on the ground. Because if you are given the right information, if you're given the right analysis, you feel confident in taking decisions. And what I'm seeing, and it's not a criticism to anybody or anything, and truly not to me or my team, but the level of competence varies way too much. Uh, if you're working in complex political environments, you need to have top-notch people. You cannot have good people who move from here to there and etc. So the selection of the people who work on the on who are at the forefront of the decision making makes a big, big difference. These are just two examples that I want to mention because I do see what a difference it makes to have a great team and a leader who's ready to go off and take the right decisions and risk uh, in, in doing so. Thank you. Uh, let me hand over. Thank you. Yes, please, Sarah. Some thoughts on that? Yeah, I very much agree with what uh, Donata said, um, ready, uh, like readiness to act, uh, take risks and act under uncertainty. And also, like, um, if you think about it, prevention is uh, difficult, right? Because if you prevent something, it, it won't happen. And nobody will say, oh, because you did that, uh, that conflict didn't break out. Um, so there's a little bit of a, of a, a tricky situation in terms of incentives. Um, and I mean, there is no award uh, for prevention that, that uh, checks these things. But I think there's a case to be made for better, basically, counterfaction analysis. Let's see what happens and why didn't it happen. Um, and studies that do this are very useful. They really trace like who also took a certain decision. And like what Donata said about uh, individual decisions, like this is a field where basically all the data analysis that we have, they, they don't really help us much. Um, um, and so to, to include uh, this, and also, as I said, like a better tailoring, really, uh, the risk assessment and the warning to what the organization needs um, and to what it can do. Um, and also, I have to say, like I, I talk, when I talk to people working on this problem and a lot of different organizations, 
I repeat myself, but they tend to have the same problems, but they don't talk to each other enough about it, right? Because then I have someone on the phone and I say, just this morning, someone else said they have the same problem, please go talk to them. And like usually the nerd community at the analyst level, um, they get along really well um, and they sometimes talk to each other, but I feel like it's it has to basically trickle up to also the upper levels with people I know who are really busy but when it comes to like how to set up a system that works, really look at some of the examples that are there, look at some of the stuff that others have tried, keep trying and don't look for the perfect model that will tell you what happens next month because that model doesn't exist. You really need to test something and see what works and go ahead with that. Mm -hmm.